I want to tell you how pleased I am to be here tonight. It's an honor for me to be invited to speak on the occasion of the Adwa anniversary, but also on the occasion of African American History Month, which is just ending, and Women's History Month, which is now underway. As you can probably guess, I'm not of Ethiopian descent. Over a century ago, while your ancestors were preparing to defend Ethiopia, my ancestors were newly arrived on these shores from Germany and from Ireland and uh, trying to make a new start. But that makes the honor for me all the greater that you would recognize me and my work because my aim is to bring attention to Adwa as part of our shared heritage, as a number of speakers tonight have emphasized. <laughs> the story of Adwa is a story of a world turned upside down. On the 1st of March, not far from the town of Adwa, an African army won a spectacular victory over a European army. Africans had defeated Europeans before. The Zulu defeated the British in 1879, for example, but these were mere setbacks in otherwise an inexorable European conquest. But the Ethiopian victory over Italy at Agua was decisive. It brought a war of conquest to an end. Agua cast doubt upon an unshakable certainty of the age, and that was that sooner or later Africans would come under the rule of Europeans. Thus, Adwa is not only the founding event in the history of modern Ethiopia, Adwa is, I argue, part of our global heritage. It was one of those events that we call world historical because we can readily imagine the world, our world, taking a different path had events gone differently. It would take me days to lay before you the entire story of Adwa and its many aftermaths. Tonight, I'm going to do three things. First, I'm going to int introduce you to some key personalities on the Ethiopian side and their efforts to prepare victory before any shots were fired. And then I'm going to tell you about the massive mobilization and creative strategic thinking that led to Ethiopian victory. And finally, I'll talk about the place of Adwa in the history of modern times. Well, the story of Adwa has uh, at its core a number of compelling personalities. Chief of them, them is Menelik, a provincial monarch who claimed a, a, a biblical ancestry originating with the liaison between King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Menelik parlayed these assets into a claim on the Ethiopian throne. Menelik had more than inspired ancestry in his favor. He had an acute strategic imagination. Menelik used external allies, including the Italians, to subdue his rivals and to lay claim to the title of Emperor of Ethiopia. A key collaborator was Taitu Betu. A youthful prophecy told her that she would wear a crown, and she had already gone through two husbands before marrying Menelik at the age of 30, making good on the prophecy. As Menelik's partner, her quick wit brought balance to Menelik's cautious and deliberate leadership. She also brought geographic balance. When Menelik and Taitu met, he was merely king of Shoa, a province in what was then southern Ethiopia. His marriage to Taitu gave him a smart, energetic, political partner with a power base in the north confirming Menelik as a leader with national credentials. Taitu was a strong personality who didn't shrink from harsh measures. At court, Taitu led a faction that opposed Menelik's tentative embrace of the Europeans, favoring a bold and aggressive military response. And it was a blend of Taitu's maximalism and Menelik's brilliant gamesmanship that culminated in the triumph at Adwa. Ethiopian triumph owed almost as much to the soft power of propaganda as it did to blood and iron. By appealing to sympathies abroad, 
Ethiopia pioneered the defining strategy of modern anti-colonial struggles, the campaign for hearts and minds. Since 1878, Menelik had relied on a Swiss engineer named Alfred Ilg for advice in dealing with Europe. Taitu and Menelik repeatedly sent Ilg on missions to Europe, and they sent him with shopping lists for new technology, farming equipment, a printing press, a cartridge reloader. Sometimes Taitu would ask him to bring back a pair of European shoes. She wore a European size 39, just in case you were interested. <laughs> it's in the correspondence. But Ilg's main responsibility was to carry out a public opinion campaign in Europe to shape Menelik's image and that of Ethiopia. Ilg also secured key markers of sovereignty, postage stamps and coins embossed with Menelik's likeness. This may seem banal, but it's really important that nations recognize one another's stamps and currency. Ilg, um, in 1892, he, uh, Ilg brought on board the journalist Casimir Mondon Videle, whose colorful reports to the European press built a favorable image of Ethiopia and its head of state. Uh, the, the official portrait of Menelik circulated by his public relations team featured a serene head of state, the antithesis of the cliched barbarian African, with a large crucifix worn high at the neck. European newspapers obligingly printed the portrait as they played up a sympathetic image of Africa's Christian monarch. Menelik and Taitu enjoyed a highly favorable public image prior to the Battle of Adwa, but in the end it would take armed force to defend Ethiopia. Menelik had worked closely with the Italians in the 1880s before he became emperor. The Italians established a foothold at the Red Sea port of Massawa in 1885. In a high-stakes game, Menelik received firearms and cash in exchange for his support of Italian expansion west and south out of Massawa, creating a colony the Italians called Eritrea. A treaty signed after Menelik became emperor in 1889 was, was to have sealed a long-term relationship between the two countries, but once secure on the imperial throne, Menelik turned on his former allies. Despite tr disputes over the meaning of the treaty and, border, and with border disputes between Ethiopia and Eritrea, a popular insurgency against the Italian presence in Eritrea led to warfare in 1895. Now, the opening campaigns did not go well for Ethiopia. By the fall of 1895, Italian troops were well south of the agreed upon frontier. They pushed as far south as Lake Ashenge, a mere 250 miles from Addis Ababa. Italy now occupied an additional 7,000 square miles of Ethiopian territory, an area nearly the size of New Jersey. The occupied area included the holy city of Aksum, the historic coronation city for Ethiopia's rulers. No ruler of Ethiopia could let this stand. Shift your attention now to the imperial capital of Addis Ababa. It's Saturday, market day, September 1895. Two heralds make their way to the top of a mound overlooking the market. Each carried a staff topped by banners in the imperial colors. A horn sounded, people gathered round to hear an imperial proclamation. The emperor was calling the nation to arms. Ethiopia was going to war. In towns and villages, just as in Addis, the call went out, and within minutes, men were off in all directions to relay the news, transferring this, the call to arms. Shield, lance, rifle, and 10 days supply of food, these were the requirements of a soldier. Women prepared in Jera, horns were filled with butter and berbere. Cartridge belts were slipped over the shoulder or around the waist, all able-bodied men were to answer the call to arms, 
and on the appointed day, they were to move to the established rendezvous points. This kind of ad hoc recruitment or militia recruitment had served Ethiopia well in the past, notably in the struggle against the Egyptian expansion in the 1870s. The risk in this informal system, of course, is the risk of disloyalty. Menelik was the emperor of Ethiopia, but he had clawed his way into that position and he'd made enemies along the way. In his five years as emperor, he had built a web of relationships based on marriage, blood, trust, but also intimidation. The success of the mobilization, indeed the campaign itself, would depend on the strength of those relationships. Manelik's closest supporters included his cousin, Makonun, Wele, the brother of Empress Taitu, Michael, a convert from Islam, and viceroy in the land of the Wolo Oromo. But he also needed Mangasha, the resentful son of Manelik's predecessor, Tekle Haimanat, the king of Gojam and rival for the throne, Alula, a patron who resented Manelik's earlier dealings with the Italians. These relationships would all be tested on the march. Some would fray, and up until the eve of the Battle of Agua, Intel Italian intelligence reports crackled with speculation about who might peel away from Menelik, leaving his army and Ethiopia fatally exposed. Menelik would lead a march northward from Addis Ababa, starting on the 11th of October, 1895. Troops of the south would assemble just outside the capital, while subordinates farther north were to join him with their forces en route at Lake Ashenge and at Mekele, respectively 250 and 310 miles north of the capital. There would be two minor battles with the Italians at Ambalaje and Mekele before the final confrontation at Adla. Ethiopian armies could move with awe-inspiring speed, but Menelik and Taitu were in no hurry. They were taking nothing for granted. With every step, the imperial couple would be testing local opinion and the loyalty of subordinates who had pledged to join the defense of Ethiopia. They took comfort from the size of the force that answered their call, as well as the vast tribute that they received along the way. Taitu gloried in the march that put imperial power and splendor on display. Her entourage dwarfed all but the emperors, which she followed in the, on the march. Taitu's musical detail alone numbered over 100. Thanks to them, the empress never lacked for a soundtrack. As, as her group moved out, her performers played and sang a musical motif that repeated after four measures. This is the, the piece of music. And we have this thanks to an Italian prisoner who actually knew musical notation, he, he wrote it down. At the time that he built up his army, Manelik worked to reduce expectations. Lowball estimates of the size of his army were leaked and they were eagerly picked up by the Italians. Manelik's court also produced rumors of rancor. Menelik would, uh, uh, Maconin would betray Menelik for the emperor's crown, or maybe the Tekle Hymenot would bolt and take his army with him. It was even said that Menelik had been hit by lightning and struck dumb, or perhaps killed. Every scrap of news reassured the Italians and bolstered their confidence that they would face a small, fractured, and demoralized opponent. In fact, the opposite was true. By the first combat of early December, Menelik had amassed a, a force of about 100,000, the largest modern Africa had ever seen. Confident, well-fed, in high spirits, and equipped with modern firearms, including artillery, and outnumbering Italian forces by more than four to one, Menelik's army was rewriting the rules of colonial warfare. There were two smaller military confrontations during the Adwa campaign prior to the battle itself. The first of these occurred in December of 1895 when Menelik's 
advanced guard commanded by Marconin confronted an Italian outpost at the natural fort fortress known as Ambalaje. Major Pietro Tozelli uh, was commander at this outpost. Tozelli expected to face a very modest force. As recently as July, he anticipated a force of no more than 4,500. He wrote this in a letter to his brother. Instead, from the heights of Ambalaje, Tozelli and his men watched in awe as Maconan's forces, nearly 40,000 strong, streamed over the passes into the valley opposite. The sheer imbalance of forces left little doubt about the outcome when the fighting began on the morning of the 7th of December. By 1 p.m., the fighting was over. The retreat turned into a massacre. The next stop in Menelik's advance was uh, is, uh, Makonin, the aftermath of Ambalaje. Uh, by 1 p.m., the fighting was over. The retreat turned into massacre. The next stop in Menelik's advance was Mekele, the capital of, of Tigray. There, Major Giuseppe Galliano and a force of 12,000 men were holed up in a fort, and their job was to delay the Ethiopian advance as long as possible while reinforcements arrived from Italy at the rate of nearly three troop ships a week. The Ethiopians lay siege to the fort, and repeated attempts to take it by force failed. In the end, it was a shortage of water that forced a negotiated surrender. Galliano's forces held out until January 20th when a white flag was raised over the fort. After Mekele, there was nothing standing between Menelik's army and Adigrat, where the Italian commander, Oreste Barattieri, was frantically concentrating his forces, 18,000 in all. A titanic confrontation loomed. What happened next was the most important military decision of the Agua campaign. Rather than march northward to confront Baratieri's forces at Adigrat, Menelik led his army away from it, to the west. Why didn't Menelik march directly? Why didn't Menelik march directly to Adigrat? To, and the answer is to attack Adigrat would be to play into Baratieri's hands. It would mean sending wave after wave of Ethiopian troops against the walls of Adigrat, where they would be cut down by Italian artillery and rifle fire. Instead, Menelik chose to ignore Adigrat and push past it to threaten Eritrea itself. He halted about 25 miles west of Adigrat at Gundapta. Baratieri moved his forces out of Adigrat in pursuit of Menelik. Baratieri set up his force about five miles away. Then, operation stalled. Neither army wished to put itself at risk by attacking the other. As the two sides remained in a standoff, attrition began to take its toll. The Ethiopian army lived off the land, and an army of 100,000 quickly wears out its welcome. Soldiers were sent to forage over ever greater distances from the main camp. On the Italian side, supply lines were stretched to the limit, and most decisively, Baratieri's officers were becoming restless. All his brigadier generals, Matteo Albertone, Giuseppe Aramondi, Vittorio da Bormida, were from the northern Italian nobility. And to them, Baratieri was an upstart. He had risen from modest origins, to the highest ranks of the colonial hierarchy. They resented his leadership, and as the strategic situation worsened, they were increasingly bold in showing their contempt. The military standoff ended in the final week of February, when Menelik moved his forces further westwards to the rich lands around the town of Adwa. That is, he moved his army away from his enemy. Superficially, Menelik's moved move was a sign of weakness. It looked like the beginning of a retreat, but it could also be interpreted as a necessary move in search of food, or even as the prelude to an invasion of Eritrea, because it put Menelik and his forces that much closer to a westerly route to the north. Baratieri was not fooled. 
He correctly understood the risks posed by Menelik's latest move. The next day, the 23rd of February, Barakieri ordered preparations for a retreat north toward Eritrea. That move would mirror Menelik's by putting the Italians closer to Eritrea on a parallel route. Baratieri's officers pounced on what they saw as a sign of ineptitude. One mocked Baratieri's failure to pursue a retreating enemy with the words, the enemy retreats and we do the same. Rattled by criticism from his officers, Baratieri called off the retreat. On the 28th of February, he called his generals to his tent for a candid airing of military options. Abormida spoke first. Never retreat, he began. No one, he argued, would understand why the army would retreat after spending months preparing to confront the enemy. And Dabarmida even put a price on honor. Italy would prefer the loss of 3,000 men, he said, to a dishonorable retreat. And the other officers agreed. Baratieri closed the meeting with words that ought to have brought his generals back down to earth. He said, the enemy is valiant and despises death. The following evening, the 29th of February, it was a leap year, 1896, Baratieri called the generals back to inform them of his decision. That night, the army would advance in three columns toward Adwa. By morning, they would occupy two mountain passes east of Adwa. General Dabarmida's column would occupy the northern pass, Albertoni's column would occupy the southern pass, and Aramondi's troops would occupy the ground between. Militarily, the march would accomplish a number of things. First of all, it would reduce the distance, once again, between the two forces. When the Ethiopians awoke on the morning of the 1st of March, they would find the Italians dug in at the pass in a very strong position, just five miles to their east. Such a provocative move would make it difficult for the Ethiopians to refuse to attack. Second, it would put the Italian forces in a dominant position. The ground leading up to the passes narrowed, and the attacking Ethiopians, fatigued from the climb, would be funneled into compact masses just in front of the Italian guns. The mountains separating the town of Adwa from the Gundapta Plains are barren in February. It's the end of the dry season. Three peaks, Ishasho, Rayo, and Semayata, loom over the surrounding terrain. Both Ishasho and Semayata are 10,000 feet high. At 9,000, Rayo is not nearly as high, but it's unmistakable. Its gnarly, bulbous profile is impossible to ignore. This is where the Italian troops were to stop at the end of a nighttime march and prepare for the Ethiopian attack in the morning. By 3.30 a.m., Albertoni's advance guard, led by Major Domenico Turito, was already at the pass between Rayo and Samayata. That was the assigned rendezvous point. He waited. Half an hour later, the remainder of the column arrived. General Albertoni walked towards Major Torito and asked why he had stopped. This is our rendezvous, Torito answered. Albertoni argued with Torito and he told him the real rendezvous was farther ahead. Go ahead, I don't want any hesitation, Albertoni barked. You're not afraid, are you? Albertoni's bullying remark was all that was needed. Torito rounded up his men and plunged down to the slope to the valley below. By 5.30 in the morning, Torito and his men were well to the west of the passes. The sky was showing the first signs of dawn as they descended another 400 feet. Now, in full daylight and with the aid of a pair of binoculars, they could have made out the huts and the churches of Adwa, as well as the thousands of Ethiopian tents in the, in the Adwa plain. Instead, in the damp yellow-blue light of dawn, they nearly walked into the middle of the Ethiopian camp. Ethiopian sentries fired warning shots and took cover. It was a little after 6 a.m. The Battle of Adwa had begun. Torito had stumbled upon Rasmangasha's forces. That's the best that the evidence suggests. 
As the sounds of gunfire ricocheted, ricocheted among the hills, the entire Ethiopian army made ready. Empress Taitu had 5,000 men in the vicinity, commanded by Balcha, and they were quickly engaged. Tekle Haimanat, king of Gojam, had four to 5,000 men a short jog away, and Taitu's brother had another 10,000 nearby. As Torito's forces took up position to hold on, the main portion of Albertoni's column was waiting on a gently sloping hillside called Adivechi, more than a mile behind. This high ground, about 300 feet wide, offered plenty of room for Albertoni's battalions to take up their positions. Ethiopian forces attacked Albertoni's center, pinning them in place. This clip puts the entire sequence together for you. Ethiopian riflemen, including Menelik's Imperial Guard, descended into the valley with a full glare of the morning sun in their eyes. They started first in smaller numbers and then in concentrated masses, making easy targets for the Italians at the range of about 1,200 meters. And soon all four of uh, 14 Italian artillery pieces were firing shrapnel, the weapon of choice against infantry. The first Ethiopian attacks were repulsed, but each time the Ethiopian infantry faltered, another charge would follow. Empress Taitu shouted praise and encouragement. In an unusual gesture, she, walked, she approached her soldiers on foot and pulled aside her veil to speak. As an Ethiopian chronicler put it, she abandoned her womanly nature and acted like a warrior, seasoned by combat. So an unveiled empress going about on foot shocked and motivated the soldiers as much as her words. Quote, what is going on? Courage, victory is ours. Other women joined Taitu. With their manly virtue at stake, the soldiers dared not show fear. Around 6.30, Baratieri and his staff were at the pass. In the brightening light, they could make out Albertoni's position and the developing Ethiopian attack. Albertoni would need help in order to extricate himself. But how? Baratieri commanded Dabormina to descend from the pass and occupy an advanced position in support of Albertoni. What happened next is one of the great mysteries of the Battle of Adwa. What Baratieri intended seemed clear enough. Dabormina would link up with Albertoni. However, a few miles west of the pass, the road splits, and instead of going left, Dabarmida turned right. It was a position where Dabarmida and his men could be of little use to Albertoni, except perhaps as a diversion, drawing attackers away from Albertoni. Menelik wasted no time exploiting the Italian mistake. He ordered a column of 15,000 Ethiopian soldiers into the gap between Albertoni and Dabarmida. Effectively, effectively dividing the Italian army into three now hopelessly isolated pieces. Albertone facing off against Menelik and Taitu, Dabormida squaring off to the north, and the remainder of the, of the Italian army pinned in place at the passes. Although combat would continue into the afternoon, and sporadic fighting would continue until well after dark, by 9.30 a.m. the Battle of Adwa was effectively over. There's so much more that could be said about the events of the 1st of March, but it would take a week to tell you those stories. Instead of the time remaining, I want to offer some observations about the Adwa campaign in victory. First, the Adwa campaign deserves to be ranked among the great military campaigns of modern history. I've talked about how Ethiopia pioneered the hearts and minds approach to colonial warfare, winning over a significant portion of enemy public opinion. Ethiopia pioneered soft power techniques, we talked about diplomacy earlier, soft power techniques that would become part of the repertoire of anti-colonial warfare in the new century. I've also emphasized that Menelik's march was not only a military campaign, but a testing of national resolve. The stately march northward of Menelik and Taitu not only consolidated their rule, it also called upon the Ethiopian people, Tigrayans, 
Showens, Oromo, Walaita, and others to set aside their differences and in recognizing a common enemy, recognize a common brotherhood. Even as a conventional military campaign, the Agba campaign deserves a place among the great campaigns of modern time. Take scale alone. Robert E. Lee's Gettysburg campaign covered about 125 miles. Sherman's march to the sea during the Civil War in the US was from Atlanta to Savannah traversed 300 miles. The Agba campaign spanned five months 580 miles from Addis to Adwa. It was rivaled among 19th century military campaigns only by Napoleon's Russian campaign of 1812, which spanned three months and 490 miles from Vilnius to Moscow. Unlike Napoleon's Russian campaign, the Agwa campaign ended in victory. It This is greatness. Moreover, one of the measures of the success of the Ottawa campaign was that it made the actual battle of Ottawa unnecessary. Manilik and Taitu staged a brilliant campaign and already achieved victory by the end of February. When Manilik bypassed Adigra and threatened Eritrea, it was the military equivalent of checkmate. He, he showed that he didn't need to fight Baratieri to defeat him. Baratieri knew this. He understood that his only real option was to abandon the conquered territories, save his army, and retreat to defend Eritrea from invasion. However, under intense pressure from his brigadier generals, Baratieri canceled his order to retreat. Instead, he ordered the risky nighttime advance, and Baratieri's generals turned the advance into an outright attack. Now the global impact. The story of Adwa and Menelik dramatically enhanced the stature of Ethiopia throughout the African diaspora. Some, such as Benito Silvain of Haiti and Joseph Vitalian of Martinique, saw in Ethiopia a beacon, a kind of Zion, and made the pilgrimage from the Americas to the court of Menelik. Others, such as Booker T. Washington, Ida B. Wells, and W.E.B. Du Bois, became virtual pilgrims who elaborated an Ethiopia of the imagination. Around the globe, Adwa gave the lie to the inevitability of European domination, both political and racial. By the 1890s, what passed for common sense predicted a future for Africa that mirrored that of the United States, where native populations had given way before an irresistible tide of European settlers. Assumptions about political domination and racial superiority were thus entwined. And by setting back one, Adwa shattered pious certainties about the other. Instead, Ethiopia stood as an island of dignity and freedom, a stubborn exception within an otherwise colonized Africa. For all these reasons, Agua deserves a privileged place, not only for Ethiopia and Ethiopians, but for all of us. It was an event with global consequences, and that's why it deserves the commemoration we offer today. Thank you.